Okay, so uh, what we're going to do today are is go through some specific climate change concepts, um, and and that includes a, a, you know talking about some basic concepts about uh, climate change and impacts, um, but kind of digging more deeply into where is the uncertainty in future climate change or projections is coming from, uh, and a little bit on. Um, uh, how to work with that uncertainty. And throughout that discussion, we are embedding uh, uh, the exploration of the climate toolbox um, or the climate toolbox, uh, our tools within the climate toolbox and, and explore uh, these different tools that can help us extract historical or future climate data. Um, okay, so, um, I think the most important discussion uh, about climate is really understanding when we talk about climate, what is the climate system? And it's not necessarily only the atmosphere, and most of the time it's the atmosphere, what, that's what we have in our minds. Um, but it's really uh, the interaction of various components of the Earth system, and that includes the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, uh, and the vegetation on the land. And sometimes, you know, what's underneath the earth, like when volcano erupts, it affects uh, our climate. Well, the other component that we sometimes forget is the space itself. We get almost all the energy to drive our climate from, uh, from the sun. And, and it's important for part of that energy to leap back into the space. And if, it, if, if human tinkers with that process, you know, we affect uh, the climate and, and make, uh, and influence climate to change. And, and, and that one tinkering that's happening is really a rapid accumulation of uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Um, and so this is one solid data. So in science, we really um, you know, look for good data and, and this is as solid as it gets. So this is monitoring of carbon dioxide concentration on top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, uh, this curve is famously called the Keeling curve after um, Charles Keeling, Charles David Keeling, who started monitoring uh, CO2 back in 1958. And, uh, and really uh, what you see is uh, we have been rapidly accumulating uh, this gas in our atmosphere. And this amongst all greenhouse gases is one of the primary driver of our climate change. Uh, and so you see, uh, um, it's uh, it's crossed 400 parts per million mark uh, a, a few years ago, and it's already uh, crossed the 420 mark. So it's just the rapidity at which it's accumulating is is um, is pretty incredible. Um, but you know, on the other side of rapid accumulation is uh, that a gas like CO2 stays a very long time in the atmosphere. Uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, once you put it out there, it stays. So it's really the question of how much you put it. Once it's there, it's going to stay for a very, very long time. Um, so what is uh, the accumulation of um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases doing in, uh, to our climate system? What essentially it's doing is it's, um, allowing less of the energy that the Earth's receiving from the sun to go back into the space. Um, and when that happens, you're accumulating more heat in the climate system. So yeah, that's what greenhouse gas effect is. We're just accumulating more of the heat in our climate system, creating an imbalance uh, from what it was uh, previously. Um, and so where is all this heat going? Uh, much of this heat is going into our oceans, uh, over 90%. Uh, an ocean is very kindly taking it all, but you know, it, it, you know, it, it's possible that it takes less of it as uh, as it warms up um, itself. So, anyways, but uh, all these accumulated heat in our climate system and primarily in our ocean is, is driving changes in our climate and changes in our weather and climate extremes. So droughts and flooding, intensity increasing, um, the wildfire. So kind of uh, 
is the is the accumulated heat that is driving uh, uh, this extreme these extremes in climate. Um, yeah, just a little more look at how much uh, of this heat is being accumulated. And I said, you know, uh, the better way to qualify our ongoing climate change would be as the rapid heating of the climate system. Like that would be an appropriate definition of what's going on. Um, and, and so if you just count the amount of heat that has accumulated since 1970s, like close to 5 billion, uh, billion as in B, uh, B, as, uh, B for billion, um, so about 5 billion atomic bombs worth of heat has been accumulated in our climate system. And so that comes out to a rate of four atomic bombs per second. But if you heard uh, Doug Clark's talk this morning, 2021 was a special year where we just saw that the heat in the ocean just uh, uh, was, uh, the accumulated heat in the ocean was much more. It was closer to like seven uh, atomic bombs per second. So we are also kind of increasing the rate at which we are heating the planet. So as if four was not enough, we had seven atomic bombs per second of heat accumulated in 2021. So that's a very worrying sign um, for us. Uh, and yeah, this is where I kind of leave it, um, the discussion on um, what's going on with, uh, with climate uh, and emissions. But I think I'll get change gears and get into this uh, piece about how do we understand climate change and its impacts um, at really regional scales and local scales. And so going back here, uh, you know, the greenhouse gases are expected to drive these changes. And already we have uh, committed quite a bit of climate change with this kind of emission that we've done. Um, in a very short period of time. But it's only part of the story for the 21st century. And so if you look at this graph, basically show uh, the plausible future emission scenarios and the kind of the concentration of CO2 that can emerge out of those different emission scenarios. And, and so you see that's, that's, that's a very big window to choose from. And so where we are uh, right now, 2022, um, as I showed you in, in the previous slide, that's where we're around close to 420, but you can see um, the potential for uh, future emission, future concentration to be anywhere from 400 to over a thousand parts per million is there. Um, so, uh, and, and you see these terms out here that are used uh, quite a bit in the community and uh, I will touch a little bit on that. So you see the word RCPs and the SSPs. Um, again, they, they refer to a particular emission pathway or emission scenario, a P is actually for pathway. Um, and so you have within these uh, scenarios, kind of the low emission scenarios, the kind of the medium range emission scenarios and the high emission scenarios. And of course the question, one of the question is, you know, how is climate going to change under these different emission scenarios and what impacts it will produce? So how do we go about understanding those things? And for that, we need this tool called the global climate model, um, you know, which is one of the primary tools out there to project future climate. And what this is, is basically you're modeling the climate system uh, and which is a complicated business. So you need to represent and model uh, most, many of the physical processes uh, that govern the Earth's climate system. So it, some of them are shown here, just making sure uh, all the radiation element are, are working right, uh, the process of energy and moisture transfer across uh, land and ocean or within land and within ocean, uh, et cetera. So, you know, millions and millions of processes uh, uh, need to be um, simulated or presented. Uh, and, and, and so these uh, task of running a global climate model is, is, is a very big and complicated task. And that's why you have these modeling centers um, 
you know, many countries don't have a, a global climate model. Um, so, you know, mostly advanced countries have had uh, uh, these centers that could actually run these models. And so we have about more than uh, 20 independent, uh, and I put them in quotes because no model is really independent. You're sharing information, sharing uh, understanding about processes, even codes. Um, and so we have these modeling centers that run these climate models and come up with their best models. So not one model, they can come up with more than one model. And all that information gets compiled into what we call the CMIP, the Couple Model into Comparison Project. Right? Um, and, and then those data become available to scientists uh, to kind of uh, you know, make sense of uh, the nature of climate change and impacts it'll produce. So, uh, so the kind of data that five, six, so CMIX six is the most recent data, uh, but there are a lot of tools that are made on CMIX five, uh, uh, and and there are downscale data based on CMIX five that's available, which is not available for CMIX six. So we tell our practitioners work with both CMIX five and CMIX six um, wherever you can. And 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 the one thing I should point out that if you look at uh, just the broad scale climate change between CMIX five and CMIX six, they are very similar. So how do we get to modeling climate change at very large scale uh, to, to understanding impacts at local scale? And so it's really a process which, uh, which goes through a flow where you make a choice about what greenhouse gas scenarios you need to work with that gets fed into your models. And, and, and the data output from those models uh, goes through another process and is run by a totally different group of people who downscale these data sets to find a resolution. Uh, they correct for biases that exist in, in the models. And I'll talk about that in a bit, um, the downscaling piece, and that those downscale data then get fed into uh, your an operational model or an impacts model. Uh, and that could result that could deliver a, a quantitative uh, output from that model, or it could be used more qualitatively to understand impacts. But this is just one, one example of what the flow could look like. Um, and any time you go through that flow, uh, you can create uncertainty. So, uh, and we're just getting into this uh, discussion of uncertainty here, but um, uncertainty comes from I showed you that graph early on about what the direction of future emissions could look like. Uh, there's uncertainty there, but you know every model could be different from what another in terms of its sensitivity and the output it's providing. So just the global climate model could provide uncertainty. And then as that data gets downscaled and used an impact model, uh, it could start creating uncertainties. So the envelope of uncertainty kind of grows as you kind of go through this flow. And it's important to recognize uh, uh, you know, where the uncertainty is coming from and how to work with that uncertainty. Okay. So I'll say a little bit on downscaling at this point, and then we'll, we'll get into our first uh, climate toolbox exercise. Um, so, you know, downscale data is, you hear a lot. I mean, as a climate scientist, practitioner approached me, approach me all the time, like what downscale climate data should I use? Um, and, and so it's important to understand what just downscaling means, uh, uh, like in the simplest terms, and why do we need downscale data? And I, I feel that one of the main reason we need downscale data is to have uh, the data available to us at the right scale to run our impacts model or to do our work, basically. So if our model takes in one kilometer gridded data uh, and at daily time step, we need both of those data set available to kind of run our model. So that, that's kind of one big reason uh, the demand for downscale data is there and at a critical scale. Um, so there, you do have downscale data available at multiple different spatial and temporal scales. 
And so uh, there's a choice that needs to be made. Uh, and also the downscaling process is different. There, there are dynamical downscaling and statistical downscaling and the different kinds of statistical downscaling. And that's one discussion I'm not going to go into today. Uh, it's, it's, it just uh, can take one or more sessions just to talk about those things. Uh, but just to point out, there are different kinds of downscaling. It's a good idea to talk to a climate scientist to kind of understand what's an appropriate data to use. And you may find that there are, there are different uh, downscale data set that could be appropriate, and then you can make a choice on those. Um, one last thing I want to say here is that there are two steps that are critical to downscaling. Um, the first being uh, bias correction. And I said earlier, there are biases. So when you do the global climate modeling, you're trying to correct uh, things at global scale, but you can find biases at, at regional scales. You might find that the, the, the model is three degrees warmer in your location, um, and then you need to bias correct for that, or it's, it's seeing 50% more precipitation and you need to bias correct for that. Um, so that's one step, and I'm going to show one more slide about it next. And the other piece is increasing the spatial resolution of, of that. And I would say that the bias correction step is usually the more complicated step. Increasing resolution, at least in the stati statistical modeling sense, is, is an easier one. Although in a downscale, uh, in a dynamical downscaling, where you run another model to downscale, I think uh, that could be a whole different uh, um, issue. Um, yeah, so one quick word on uh, bias correction, and I just want to show you this graphic to illustrate that. So this could be a region somewhere in uh, uh, a stream flow somewhere in Western US, uh, maybe spot of the Colorado River Basin based on the, the source here. But what you see here uh, are uh, actually, I uh, beg your pardon, it's the, 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 the variable is precipitation and not stream flow. Um, and so what you see here is our seasonal precipitation um, com, uh, data set coming out of uh, the, the global climate model shown in, in, in pink. Um, and then what you have in black are the observed data on precipitation. Um, so you start to see that there are biases uh, in the global climate model. So most of the models uh, for this case were showing a lower precipitation than actual. Some were showing higher. Um, and, if, and you can look at something similar for all seasons. Um, and so the bias correction step uh, provided a new data, which is in green, that's closer to uh, the observation. And, and see that step is critical to happen uh, um, to provide data that then you can use to, uh, to put a new impacts model and, and get the results and quantities that then you can uh, say that they were it was largely bias free from the input drivers. Okay, so I'll stop at this point and see if there are questions before we move into the climate toolbox discussion. Just gonna stop sharing. Yeah, please feel free to ask all in any questions. Um, MTS, can I ask you a quick question? Please. Um, so I love I love that you put the part in there about like, you know, what downscaling to use, like ask a climate scientist. Um, so where might folks, if they didn't know um, people to kind of contact and ask um, for that kind of information, where might they be able to find a climate scientist that they could ask? That's a great question, you know. <laughs> That's why we need a social scientist. To, I think we need a social scientist to figure out that question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I do realize networking is key here, uh, Heather, and um, and people know different experts through this networking thing, you know, and uh, you know, so. The, the, the dangerous game of doing this kind of work is that you work with some stakeholders and they tell about you to others and they reach out to you and just the network grows. And 
Um, so I mean, so we need both more of these people who can help out make those uh, answer those questions. Um, but I also see, you know, uh, how we can just manage our network efficiently. And you know, but do you have an answer to that yourself, Heather? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously, like the North Central Climate Adaptation Science <laughs> Center, like you can always reach out to us and we can help you find um, folks in your region, folks that might specialize in the particular type of questions that you might have to help you find that particular downscaling that might be um, the best. You know, you can talk to our wonderful MTAs, um, but, you know, we've got a whole kind of slew of people in our network, in our Rolodex, um, that we can help connect you with. That's part of um, what we do as a CASC. So please feel free to reach out if you need to ask a climate scientist a question and you don't have one in your own Rolodex or network um, to consult directly. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to add uh, where you could find a climate scientist. This is Catherine. Um, and there's two, there's two other sources that I can think of to, um, is one, you can contact your state climate office. Um, every state actually has a climate office. Um, for example, we have a Washington state climate um, climate office, and and then you have Colorado state climate office. Every state has a climate uh, climate office, and they can refer you to and connect you to climate scientists, and they can also help you to find data. Um, secondly, every state has a state climatologist, and um, their job is also to connect you to. Um, climate data and to help you answer your questions. And so, and you can look those up on the web to find out who your state climatologist is, um, but that is a good source to start 